Well, we're in Revelation 13, if you uh, remember way back when we've had our last lesson. Last year, um, seems like forever ago, but we are in Revelation 13, uh, 11 is where we'll begin to, to begin our study again. This is the section we're in that we've been in for a few weeks. Uh, the seven visions that you have from chapter 12 that's beginning all the way through chapter 15, verse 4. Uh, we looked already at the conflict of the serpent with the woman and her seed. Uh, really a, as a picture of uh, the conflict between uh, the, the forces of evil, namely the devil, uh, seeking to destroy Christ and his church and how the Lord will provide for his church and protect his church even though there is an enemy out there. And now we're looking at some agents of the devil. And the last time we met, we looked at the first part of chapter 13, uh, the persecution by the beast from the sea as he's described there, uh, sometimes called the Antichrist. We'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, today we're gonna be looking at this second beast that's described in the latter part of chapter 13. And then we've got some other things to look at in the coming weeks with these seven visions. Um, we talked a bit last time about the Antichrist. Matthew 24, Luke 21, 2 Thessalonians 2 are some places where the Antichrist is mentioned in the New Testament. 1 John 2, uh, 2 John 7, he's mentioned that, that term is used in, uh, in those passages. But uh, what we see throughout history is that there are antichrists, plural, um, leading up to the final antichrist that will be uh, maybe a, a person that represents the institution. There's anti-Christian uh, institutions in our world, anti-Christian people in our world that seek to do the, the bidding of the devil just leading up and leading up to and just as uh, the ultimate antichrist at the end of the age. So we have here um, the references to antichrist. Now let's just dive in and read and then we'll pick this passage apart. Revelation 13, 11 through 18. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. It performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both slave and free, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of, of a man, and his number is 666. All right. Well, the first beast we looked at last time signified, we said, the state that persecutes believers whose allegiance to their heavenly citizenship trumps their allegiance to their earthly citizenship. So we... If you remember back in Revelation, uh, back in Daniel's chapter 7, a lot of the imagery that is used here uh, in Revelation 13, especially the first 10 verses, uh, that imagery of a beast and, and all the animals that are mentioned there and the horns and so forth, uh, the imagery is very much like that which we see in Daniel chapter 7. And we know in Daniel chapter 7 that the various beasts that are described there represent kingdoms that oppose God's people. And so we can look at this first beast and, and see that it is going to be, uh, this antichrist is going to be 
uh, tied to the state, uh, persecuting the church, opposing Christ and his people. And um, that's uh, what we learned from the first 10 verses. And, you know, the whole book of Revelation is a call for Christians to persevere in the face of the persecution. And we saw in some of the letters to the churches that they were being forced by the various government officials to uh, worship Caesar um, so that they could have jobs and, and um, you know, various uh, persecutions that came because what, what it meant to be a good Roman was to uh, follow suit uh, with all the Caesar worship and so forth and pagan worship. And to be a Christian, you know, that was no good. That caused you to be, uh, you know, uh, unpatriotic. And, you know, one day maybe we will face that. And maybe we already are in some ways that if we follow these, un, uh, you know, Christian ways that we'll be branded as unpatriotic because we're not going along with what the rest of the country is going along with. So we need to be aware of that. So that's what we saw with the first beast. Now, this second beast is, uh, is a little different, but he works for the first beast. Now, we saw also last time that the first beast mimics Christ. Uh, he was wounded and he, and he rose again. Uh, that signified the fact that Satan and his forces were dealt a great blow when Christ died on the cross. He conquered death, the devil, he conquered sin. Um, but Satan still has some power and he's still working in, in our world. And uh, this beast, this institution, this antichrist movement that exists in the world um, continues until this day. And uh, even though Christ is victorious, the battle's been won, uh, but the war rages on. So Revelation 13 uh, Mimics, the, the beast there mimics Christ in several ways. We pointed those out last time. You can refer to the last lesson. It's, it's uh, on the YouTube channel. But as we look at this first verse, chapter 11, verse 11, it says, Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. Now, we have encountered a lamb uh, in Revelation before. What was that? Jesus, right? Uh, back in chapter 5, where John has the vision in heaven and he sees the throne of God in chapter 4. And, uh, he's uh, they're worried about the seal of God, the, the will of God being carried out. Who is, who is able to open the scroll with all of its seals? And nobody was able to open, but wait, yes, there is one. The line of the tribe of Judah, and he turns and he sees a lamb. And it's, of course, it's Christ that's symbolized there. So here, this second beast is, again, mimicking Christ like the first beast does. Uh, he looks like a lamb, but he's really a wolf. And, of course, you have that imagery in the scriptures as well. Beware of the wolf in sheep's clothing. And that's what this beast is, a wolf in sheep's clothing. He looks like a lamb, but uh, it speaks like a dragon, like the devil. It had two horns. And if we look at Daniel 8, 3, the following chapter from Daniel 7 that had all the imagery we saw with the beast and Daniel's visions, Daniel has another vision and he says, I raised my eyes and saw and behold a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other and the higher one came up last. And you can go and read that and see some of the same imagery that we have here. Uh, there's other reasons why there may be two horns instead of seven horns or ten horns like we've seen on some of the other visions uh, that John has had. But this, this ram, uh, this, this lamb, uh, draws upon that, that imagery that we have here in Daniel 8.3. Now, like the first beast, this beast speaks with the full authority of the devil. He speaks like a dragon, and the dragon is identified as, as the devil in chapter 12. Now, this beast 
is later referred to as not the second beast or the beast from the land, but he's referred to as the false prophet. We see that in chapter 16. I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet three unclean spirits like frogs. Uh, so you've got the dragon, chapter 12, the beast, chapter 13, 1 through 10, and then the mouth of the false prophet, that is this second beast is the same person or institution. Revelation 19, 20, the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. So here Revelation 19 is referencing the passage that we're looking at today. And then in Revelation 20, the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur uh, where the beast and the false prophet were and they were tormented day and night forever and ever. Now that's, that's important that we understand that this is a false prophet uh, because his function that, as we will see, really is to try to, to deceive and lead people astray, uh, especially believers. In verse 12, where we see these pa passages, he performs great signs. Verse 13, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. He's a satanic counterfeit of the true prophet Moses, right? Uh, Moses performed great signs before Pharaoh in Egypt. Uh, he was God's representative. But here, this beast is also performing great signs, counterfeit signs. And it's said that he makes fire come down of, of, out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. That makes him a counterfeit prophet uh, of the prophet who? Who made fire come down out of heaven? Make sure you're awake. Elijah, yes. All right. When, you remember when we had the two witnesses, uh, Moses and Elijah, were mentioned there back in chapter 11. The fire proceeded out of their mouth. And, and fire indicates the speaking of God's word that convinces, convicts and, and judges sinner, sinners. And so they, the witnesses spoke uh, the words of judgment against sinners. But here... They are making fire come down from mimicking Moses, mimicking Elijah. And so they're doing a counterfeit work of representing God. They're not actually representing God. They're representing the beast who's an agent of Satan. So he's, this beast is an agent of, of Satan. Now, there's numerous places where in the New Testament, Jesus and others are talking about the end times and it talks about false prophets. Matthew 7, 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Matthew 24, 4, And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. 24, 11, Many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 9, The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders. 2 Peter 2, False prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. As we consider uh, the purpose of this second beast, um, we can look towards the end times, of course, and know that there's going to be a great apostasy and, and unfaithfulness, and, and many people will be deceived. But this was written to first century, the first century church. And as we look back at those letters in chapters 2 and 3, the same message was given to them as well. Beware of the false prophets. You see that in several of the letters. And uh, some of them had already had false prophets in their midst. And you remember when Paul was with the, uh, meeting with the Ephesian elders late in the book of Acts? He, he goes, swings by Ephesus, and he says, this is the last time I'm going to see you. 
And he gives them an exhortation. He says, uh, beware of the wolves that are going to come in. And, and some will be even amongst you. Uh, watch out for the false teaching. So we can uh, kind of think of Revelation as being way in the future, or maybe we're thinking about it, well, it's coming alive today. But even if the Lord doesn't come back for another 1,000 years or 10,000 years, this is relevant to us today as it was in the first century because we need to be aware of false teaching and teaching that causes us to compromise with the world. You know, Wednesday night we had a good lesson on uh, the, the Presbyterian Church, the history of the Presbyterian Church and, and, uh, and what we've seen during this period in the 1850s, 1830s to 1850s, there was a real wrestling uh, with, with whether or not to compromise on certain things. And, you know, some, some did and some didn't, and, and it caused a great controversy in the church. Well, history continues to repeat itself, and this is kind of the main lesson that we get from this particular passage is beware of the false teaching, and we need to stick with God's Word. It goes nicely with a sermon today because we have uh, uh, those disciples, so-called disciples that were following Jesus, and and then they go, wait, this is too, this, he's, this is crazy what he's saying. Uh, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to this? And, and they stop following Jesus. You know, he wasn't telling them what they wanted to hear. And, you know, a lot of churches today are watering down their message because they want to tell people what, you know, everybody, they want to have a big crowd. So they got to tell people what they want to hear. That's what Paul warned Timothy in 2 Timothy. People will want to hear what their itching ears want. And so we need to be faithful to God's word, uh, faithful to the truth. And uh, there's going to be many who will pressure us to compromise, and we need to stand strong. And that's what's going on here uh, in Revelation, 12, uh, Revelation 13. Verse 14, by, by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on the earth, telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. It was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. This image of the beast that they make, does that bring to mind any Old Testament story? Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar and Daniel, again Daniel, Daniel chapter 3. He made an image of himself. And when the trumpets blew, everybody was supposed to bow down and, and worship the image. But three people didn't do that. Who were they? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down and worship the image. And they were thrown into the fiery furnace. And of course, the Lord preserved them. I believe this passage is supposed to bring that to mind to its readers. Um, you know, they were faithful to the Lord. They did not bow down and worship the image, and the Lord preserved them through that. What a great message for a persecuted church in the first century, second, third, fourth, 21st century, that uh, God, Jesus will be with you even in the midst of the flames, uh, but stand strong for the truth. Stand strong for the Lord. Don't worship the beast or its image. Don't worship anything but the Lord God. But here we have false worship, um, and false signs that are being uh, put forward to deceive many people and those who would not worship the image being put to death just as they were done in Nebuchadnezzar's time. All right, well, 16 through 18. So we see here, uh, now we're getting to the more difficult part, the controversial part. Um, I had... I mentioned to a, a person that I know uh, who's, uh, you know, not related to the church or any, any of this. Uh, I told him that I was teaching a Sunday school on Revelation. And his first question to me was, what is the number of the beast? What do you, what do you think is the mark of the beast? Or, uh, and, and what is that? And uh, he didn't wait to hear my answer uh, much. I, st I started a long explanation. But. Uh, got distracted, so we didn't get to get into it very much. But here we go. This is the more uh, 
section. This is the section where more ink has been spilled, uh, trying to figure out what this is all talking about and some, a lot of speculation about. Um, so first of all, before we get into that number and, and uh, the mark, uh, look at the, the universality of this at the end uh, of the age. Also, it, it caused all small, great, rich, poor, free, and slave, everybody uh, is going to be included in this um, persecution and requirement uh, that everybody toes the line and, and complies with what the beast wants. So it's, it's not like anybody's going to be um, preserved from this just because you're, you've got certain status or you're from a certain country or wherever you might be. Um, and, and it's economic in nature, verse 17. No one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. Now, what is the mark? Tells us the name of the beast or the number of its name. Now, there's been, uh, through the ages, um, many opinions about what that is. Um, it might be, as this uh, Greg Beale mentions in his commentary, uh, an allusion, the mark being an allusion to the ancient practice of branding or tattooing disobedient slaves, soldiers, uh, loyal de devotees to gods of various religions. If the association with slaves in mind, then the beast worshipers are seen as his property. They belong to the beast, um, which makes sense. Those who are marked with uh, the 144,000 that symbolizes the people of God are marked with God's name on, on their foreheads. We saw that. We'll see that in a moment. I'll pull up that passage. But uh, they belong to the Lord. So this could mean his property. If soldiers or religious devotees are in view, the worshipers are seen as the beast faithful followers. Um, so the mark is clearly figurative, uh, like most everything in, or everything in Revelation. And uh, whether it's, uh, you know, a lot of people think, oh, you know, when I was in the 80s, uh, people said, oh, they're putting microchips in people. And, and there were people, you know, when we had the vaccines, there were people who were saying, oh, they're putting microchips in us from the vaccine and all kinds of crazy talk like that. Um, conspiracy theories and so forth. Um, but when you look at that word, um, the word for mark, karagma, uh, one of the ways that it was used, it, it, it means a likeness or a mark or, or, or a symbol. Uh, it was used for the emperor's seal on business contracts and for the impress of the Roman ruler's head on coins. So, you know, we look at our coins, we have the head of George Washington, what on the quarter, and uh, that's a karagma, a mark. So here, uh, as we think about that illusion, uh, it enforces this idea that the mark alludes to the state's political and economic st stamp of approval on people. Um, if we have this mark, if we uh, toe the line, um, if we have the character of the state, then we'll go along with the state and we belong to the state and we belong to whatever they're saying and doing. The mark on their forehead, which is the name of the beast or the number of his name, as it says there, is the opposite of what we see in chapter 7, 2 through 3 here. Uh, then I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice for the four angels who had been given power to harm earth and sea, saying, do not harm the earth or sea or the trees until we have, we have sealed the servants of our gods on their foreheads. Now, in the New Testament, sealing for the people of God, the servants of God, is the Holy Spirit being given to them. That's the seal uh, of Christians. And so that's what that's referring to. So I think if we you know, are consistent in the way that we interpret Revelation, the seal that we see here in chapter 7, um, the, the seal that we, is, the, the seal in Romans 13 is similar to this seal. 
it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a physical mark or anything like that. It can simply be that, that, it's, that, that people are marked out for belonging to the beast, uh, belonging to the state, belonging to that which is opposed to God. And then Revelation 14 refers to it again. And this is important because it's the next verse from 18. Uh, the very next verse refers to this mark uh, on, the, on, the, on believers. I looked and behold on Mount Zion stood the Lamb and with him 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. And then finally in Revelation 22, those believers will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. So there's a parallel here, you know, the, the, the good, the positive uh, mark or seal of the Holy Spirit and the name of God upon their lives uh, with those who are opposed to God and His church and who worship the beast and its image who are, or belong to the devil and his, his agents. Um, now, when we get to this... Uh, this this uh, phrase here, 17, the, the, the name of the beast or the number of its name. A lot of uh, people through the ages have tried to make this what they call, uh, I'm, and I'm going to try to pronounce this right, a, a gematria. Does anybody know what a gematria is? I didn't until yesterday. We do know what it is because you've heard this before. Um, letters of the alpha, alphabet substituted for, for numerals. And, and each letter stands for a number, and you try to make it add up to 666. And so throughout history, people have uh, tried to add up, take the number of people's letters, you know, A being 1, B2, C3, or use Greek, you know, or Hebrew or Latin even, and uh, try to get it to equal 666. And so the most popular one that you see throughout history is Nero Caesar, but they have to misspell Caesar a little bit to make it work. Um, and you see this throughout ages where people are trying to make this. I remember like uh, somebody said this about Ronald Reagan. Uh, what's Ronald Reagan's middle name? Each? Wilson. Wilson. Eh, Ronald Wilson Reagan. Every, uh, each, each word has six letters. Six, six, six. <laughs> Does anybody here think Ronald Reagan was the <laughs> Antichrist? No. But people said that back in the 80s. I guess Democrats probably <laughs> said that. <laughs> but uh, that's the point I'm trying to make is that Approaching this that way will lead to all kinds of errors. And, and, and he illustrates this. This is, again, Greg Bill. He says, according to one study, over 100 names were proposed in Britain between 1560 and 1830. Uh, and in the past century, the names of Kaiser and Hitler, among others, were also calculated to equal 666. Um, and here's one commentator uh, he, he's, he said, here's how commentators, here's their rules for how you make a name equal 666. First, if the proper name by itself will not yield 666, then add a title to it. Secondly, if the sum cannot be found in Greek, try Hebrew or even Latin. And thirdly, don't be too particular about the spelling. Uh, we can infer much from the fact that a that a key fits the lock if it is a lock in which almost any key will turn. So like my van, uh, I've got one key to the church van, but if I lock those keys in the car, I can get some old keys we have in the office to a previous church van and it will open the door of that van, but it, thankfully. But it won't crank it. <laughs> so the, the, the lock on the passenger side is not a very good lock. Any key will work. Uh, so that's kind of what uh, this interpretation says about that interpretation. So take that for what it's worth. Um, 
whether we can identify that was with a particular individual in history, I don't think that's necessary to do. I think when the beast comes, when the Antichrist comes, uh, it should be apparent to true believers uh, that, or even if we're living today, we don't know when the Lord's going to return, but if we see somebody telling us that to be unfaithful to God's word or to worship in a way that is uh, against God's word or to worship something besides God altogether, then we know that that is at least the spirit of the Antichrist, if not the Antichrist himself. Um, but when we, now, now I'm going to move positively. I want to debunk doing it that way and think about this number, uh, how, how we should think about this number 666. Um, the word number in Hebrew, in, in Revelation, that word number uh, is always used figuratively in Revelation. And usually talking about a multitude of people, like a number of people uh, is how it's used. Um, the numbers in Revelation are all symbolic numbers. They're not ne meant to be taken literally numbers. They're all symbolic. Seven, we see seven over and over again, the number of perfection. Um, we see uh, three used again. Trinity's three. Um, we see that, that again, perfection. Um, uh, 144,000 means a great multitude. It's 12 times 12 times 1,000, showing just uh, all the sum total of God's people. So the, the numbers are symbolic. So this is a, a symbolic number as well. The number seven, as I mentioned, symbolizes completeness. We've got the seven trumpets, the seven seals, the seven visions, the seven bowls of wrath, etc. Um, that's, com that's completeness or perfection. So six is incompleteness. It's one less than completeness. It's one less than perfection. Uh, three, as I mentioned, is perfection with the Trinity being perfectly three, uh, three and one. Uh, here we have three sixes. So again, it's a uh, mimicking of God, but imperfect. So if God is, say, you could say God, seven, 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 <laughs> perfection, three perfections. Uh, here we have everything that is imperfect and everything that's sinful and broken. And so um, the number, I don't want to read that. Um, so Again, the number of the beast is the number of uh, a man. The word a is not in the text. Okay, so it's implied. Um, there's no, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Article, thank you. There's no article before the word uh, man. It's... The word man is in the genitive case, so it's even the of is implied. Uh, so it's the number of man or a man. It's not the man. It's a or nothing at all. Is it referring to the devil? No, it's uh, referring to the number of, of man. The number of the number of man, the number, and, and here, let me read this, okay. Uh, it is, it can be translated, for it is a number of a specific person. Let's see, I'm sorry, let me back up. This is suggested further by the phrase, for the number is that of a man, which could be translated individually as, for it is a number of a specific person, you can think of it that way, but, but, but better, generically, it is the number of humanity. The word man is often generic when it occurs without an article, as here. And the, like, like, yeah, he gives some other examples. The omission of the definite article 
in 1318 suggests the general idea of humanity, not some special individual who can be discerned only through some esoteric manner of calculation. So it's, it's the number of man, unregenerate humanity, uh, in his sinfulness, um, man was created on what day? The sixth day. Man was created on the sixth day. And, and if he doesn't get to the seventh day, he doesn't enter into God's rest, the perfection of what humanity was created to be. So here's the symbol when he says it's the number of man, it's the number of uh, imperfection. It's the number of sinfulness. It's the number of, of fallen man who has not entered into rest. Only when you go to seven, the seventh day, that's when you enter into the rest, which is a picture, of, you know, a symbol of the salvation that God gives us. So this is unregenerate, unsaved, the number of man. Um, we need to understand what uh, this, this mark or this number is. It is it is living by or showing the character of embracing the world and all of its fallenness and brokenness. Now that may come out, you know, in some sort of stamp or approval or card or I don't know how that's going to work out in the very end. But um, what's more important than the physical mark or, or anything of that nature that may or may not be the case, it is am I being faithful to the Lord or am I going along with the world? The world is 666. The world uh, is broken. The world has fallen. And the devil and his agents are kind of the representatives of all that. And then they're trying to further that. So he's calling for us to have wisdom and to be faithful to the Lord and to not Worship the beast or its image uh, to not fall into that trap, not to be deceived by the world uh, or the things uh, of the world. All right. Well, I've probably made that more confusing than uh, it should be, <laughs> but uh, it is a controversial passage uh, and with a lot of different uh, uh, interpretations and understandings. I think if you back up from it, you know, we kind of got lost in the details a little bit. If you back up from it, it's a it's a encouragement to us as in the church to remain faithful to the Lord, not compromise with the world, not go along with the ways of the world, not be deceived by the things that the world is saying are okay. Uh, I had a conversation with somebody here recently, and uh, they're compromising. They used to be staunch. Uh, believers in God's word, and now they've opted for a, a, very, a different form of interpretation that allows them to ignore certain things that the Bible says that they don't like. And so they've compromised. They've bought into the teaching of the world and want to have the name of believer and Christian, but don't want to live according to God's word as it's written. So there's an example. And we're faced with that. We see a lot of people buying into that in our day and time. Um, so it's called to be faithful, which is the whole book of Revelation is all about, really. Called to be faithful in the midst of persecution, in the midst of trials. So let's pray and we'll conclude. And if you have a million questions, send them to Ken. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. They afford it to me. <laughs> okay. Lord, we thank you for this passage and we do pray that you would help us to be faithful in the midst of the pressures that we face in this world and the persecution we may face as well. Lord, we pray for all of our fellow believers throughout the world that they would be encouraged to stand strong in the midst of the trials that they face, especially those who uh, even face losing their lives, uh, their families uh, for the sake of the gospel. Lord, we pray that we would uh, be a city set on a hill, that we would be salt and light in our communities, that we would be your ambassadors, faithful to you, not compromising with the world or what it desires, but to continuously do what you would have us to do. Uh, Lord, help us to see our blind spots where we are uh, prone to ignore your word or 
uh, water it down or ignore it altogether or, or not take it seriously. We pray that you would help us to take the things that we like um, or take the things that we don't like as seriously as we do the things that we do like in your word and to submit to it and, and live under your kingship and your headship and your fatherhood. And Lord, we just pray that you would preserve us in Jesus name. Amen.